Hey everyone, welcome back to the Indie Track Room. And this is one session I've been looking forward to. Has so much girl power in this one. <laughs> Women in games, let's give it up. Okay, so we have Gwen Go from Imba Interactive and she'll be moderating this uh, panel. And then we have Anissa Sanusi from Hutch Games and Fu Li Ying from Kai Gan Games. <laughs> and I'm so sorry if I butcher your name. I tried practicing it a few times. Let's try this. Fakra Al Mansuri from Hybrid Humans. Right, let's give it up for my ladies. Take it away. You guys need the mic? Hi, everyone. Hi, thanks for coming down for this panel, you know, like every time I moderate or I'm part of a women's in panel, I'm always kind of worried that, oh, what if no men show up? So, like, <laughs> fantastic, there are men in this audience. Thank you for coming. Thank you, the women, for coming as well. This is awesome. Yeah. Um, women in games, I mean, we are everywhere. Like, MDEC, we have Yasmin, you know, and then we have all the fantastic uh, organizers behind Level Up KL. So many women, you know. But yet, it's like, we can have, we can do more. There's a lot more to do, right? And uh, today, will be mainly about celebrating the women in the industry and also talking about issues that, you know, some of you might be curious about what we face, etc., etc. So, um, I think to begin, uh, we are going to go through the panelists and uh, they're going to do a self-intro and maybe talk about um, how and why did you get into games? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Anissa Sanusi. Uh, I am actually from Malaysia. I was born in PJ. Uh, I actually went to the One Academy to learn uh, digital animation. And then I went to the UK um, and I got my degree in computer animation. So I started off in animation. I wanted to work in film and TV, uh, advertising and all that. Uh, for the first two years uh, in the UK, that's what I did. And then uh, that my portfolio for my animation work actually got me my first games job as a 2D artist in a video games company. We did um, PlayStation Vita games uh, and it, was, it wasn't a huge platform, but I learned so much on that first job alone. And after that, um, I started doing uh, UI art. So UI is user interface. Um, so uh, the, I went into frontier development to, as a UI artist. And that's when I started specializing for uh, UI. And in one of the projects there, which is Planet Coaster, that's when I started doing user experience design. And um, from there, it just became like a huge world that I'm really, really interested in and something that I would like to champion within the games industry. So the fact that I'm a woman is just kind of like, oh, it just happens to be a woman. And I'm, so what got me into games? I guess I was, I was just a little nerd from young until now, like as most of you are probably. Um, you know, I started playing the PlayStation. Um, my favorite game of all time is uh, Kingdom Hearts. That what that is what got me into animation in the first place, just because it was so beautiful. And you know, Tadahikaru. Oh my god. Anyway, um, so what got me what got me into video games specifically, aside from you know, oh my god, nerdy things, is also the fact that I was good at it. You know. Um, just because I, I love drawing. And when I got into games, I love the interactivity of video games between human and machine and between the storytelling from the designers to the player. All that kind of stuff really got me thinking like, you know, oh, there's something I want to do. And I happen to be pretty good at what I do. Well, at least I like to think so. <laughs> okay, that's another problem that I need to, to touch upon later where women tend to put themselves down. <laughs> yeah. so I was like, okay, I need to be more confident about that. Yeah, I am good at my job, yeah, all right? There you go. Yes. Yeah. yeah. See, men don't have this problem. They're, the most mediocre of men are fine with themselves, and that's how they get jobs. And women, I know so many qualified women who don't apply for jobs because they think they don't qualify. And I'm like, come on. Anyway. Um, yeah, so that's my journey into video games. Uh, you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's very good to know. Thank you for sharing. Um, so yeah, my name is Fakhra and the, the, how I got into this, like I grew up with, with video games, but I was never exposed to who makes video games. I thought like unicorns makes video games. I go to the shop and I buy the game and go back home and I play it. Um, only very later in life, I discovered that I can make games because 
uh, the professor in school was like, hey, how about we make a game for this project? I literally jumped out of my seat, was like, yes, let's do it. And then I looked around the classroom, like no one was interested. And I was like, okay, screw you guys. I'll do this a solo project. The, that was supposed to be a group project. And I spoke to the professor. I was like, yeah, cool, if you want to. Like, you're going to have to do a lot of work in three weeks. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't mind it. I want to do everything. I want to explore this. And uh, that was back in 2011. And I was like, oh, wow, this is so good. This is so fun. I got to do my own animation, my own code, my own sound effects. I recorded myself on my phone, sped it up. I already have a cartoony voice. so. I kind of helped with that as well. I pulled up my Mac and GarageBand did like the least crappiest music track and I added it to the music. Um, and it was like, wow, this is so fun. And at the same time, um, we had this huge book about human-computer interaction, and it focused about, uh, on video games and the psychology behind it. And I found that aspect to be very interesting. I've always been interested in business, and economy, in psychology, philosophy, in art, technology, science, space. Um, but I never found one field that can bring it all together. So ever since, I never got bored and I kept doing it because every day is interesting. Um, I grew up wanting to be an astronaut and I wanted to be a hacker. Um, but then I found video games. Now I'll travel to space in a few years and make a game up there. That's, uh, that's, that's the goal. That's amazing. <laughs> Over to you. Okay, so hi everybody. My name is Ling Fu. I'm a game artist slash UI artist from a local Malaysian studio called Kaigan Games. <laughs> um, so how I got into games was because I as an artist wanted to create worlds that people could experience and I found a lot of meaningful experiences within games. So I wanted to create those meaningful experiences for other people to play. Um, I'm also the primary artist for Simulacra, a fan phone horror game, and our recently released game called Simulacra Pipe Dreams. And recently, I also gave a talk in an Australian event called Parallels. Very recently, like last week. <laughs> so yeah. Thank you. Very awesome stories from how three of you got started out in games. So, I mean, the games industry is traditionally dominated by men. And, and actually, thanks to Level Up KL that we finally managed to get this panel. No, we've been talking about it for the past two years. So it's, it's really awesome that this is happening. Um, now that we have more visibility and we clearly see more women coming up to play games and make games, right? How do you foresee trends change? It, it can be sociological, it can be an industry-based thing. You know, how do you see trends changing? Um, I think when we just talk about diversity, under that is women and like everyone else. When we add diversity, it just adds so much um, layering to, to, to the game, to the experience as a whole. So I think diversity is, is great and we should all push for it. Having women point of view in video games, I think could add empathy um, to them, not necessarily, but I'm, I think like that's something I want to push for. More diversity, more empathy in video games. Um, as an industry, we've, we've matured um, enough and it's a very experimental field, even within the traditional console and mobile games. Um, and we can add so much to it. We've grown up. And the biggest example for me is like looking at what God of War used to be and what it is right now. Uh, that's an amazing level for AAA. We've seen it so many uh, times in empty space, but we've never seen it. In, or we have just like very few examples. The last verse is one. Um, so it's nice to see even um, like that being embraced in so many different levels in the industry. And I think that is because of diversity and people are starting to approach uh, video games in a very interesting way, which is like, it's awesome because we kind of like recently got into it as well. So it's good to push that, um, that uh, further. So to touch upon the um, issue on diversity, Obviously, being a woman in games panel, we'll be talking about the gender diversity, but there's also diversity within socioeconomic status um, from different backgrounds, um, from different races, from different cultures. So um, even different sexuality, if you're LGBT or if you're not. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the diversity 
with diversity comes different viewpoints, and from different viewpoints, you get a much more nuanced video game, more nuanced uh, storytelling, and something that everyone could relate to. And by everyone, I do mean everyone. Um, the but to get diverse, a diverse group of people to work on video games, the games industry as a whole needs to be inclusive. Like, there's no point if you're being exclusive and you you say no to specific people, and then you and then you expect for things to change within. Well. Video games are made by people, so without a different point of view from different kinds of people, you're going to just be churning out the same things over and over and over. I'm not going to name certain games, but you know, you know, some games are like, oh, they're still going every year, the same things, and, and, and they sell for some reason. But there's an untapped audience out there who are open to video games. In fact, we all know that video games is a lot more mainstream than film or music now. Everybody plays games thanks to mobile phones, but the whole um, segregation of like, oh, hardcore or casual games, like that's so silly. Like if they are paying, they pay for mobile games, you know, and they're still paying players. Um, so why, why are we segregating these players in such a way? Um, to bring in Anissa's point even further, like if we have more diverse people within the games industry, you can write more multi-dimensional games. So, for example, you wouldn't be able to write a game about a blind person if you don't have a blind person there. So you won't be able to write a genuine game experience about a blind person if there isn't a person who's giving you a blind person's per perspective, because we can all see, and we wouldn't know how a blind person goes about their daily lives. And there's a huge push for accessibility as well in the, in the recent years. Um, Microsoft recently released um, a controller made for people who are slightly disabled. Um, yeah, so we are being more inclusive to all types of people, not just women. But, you know, I, I would like to think it starts with women because, hey, 50% of the population are women. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. And I'll just speak to the point where in the UAE, it's a very small industry. Like we, like Hybrid Humans is the first in the development studio. The other big studio that we have is Ubisoft. Um, so we can push that envelope of the indie development scene in that country um, and we can shape it up to the way we want to. Um, so I think it's like, it depends a case by case on how big is that game development scene in the country. And you can shape it up if it's small as, as, as ours. Uh, we had the benefit of like, hey, this is what we want to do. We've seen bad examples, we've read it in media. That's a, a not to do, and this is what we should do. So it's good to kind of, I've kind of like complained a lot. I was like, oh, I don't have a lot of people that make games. I go to so many different conferences and no one talks about video games. And it got like a bit frustrating for me. My friends are so into like animation and doing art, but they never do it for video games. Um, so it's nice to kind of like see the other side of it. It's like, okay, that's a lot of BS that happens online in so many different countries because they've started this like 30 plus years ago. Um, so being in a small community, I think we have the, the power to change it and shape it up to be a more inclusive and a better place. Yeah, I really like um, all three of your points. I think to summarize, actually, um, we want to prevent gatekeeping in the industry, right? Exactly. So gatekeeping is a term where you consciously, like you're literally a person like guarding the gates of who deserves to be industry and who doesn't. And I think summarizing them, we should stop that because everybody is welcome to the games industry. So even if you're like a casual gamer or hardcore gamer, it doesn't make you any less of a gamer, any less worthy to be in the industry, right? And even if you were never a gamer to begin with, actually it's really refreshing to have a non-gamer enter the games industry because they come in with a fresh lens, right? So like, you know, even as simple as I would want to use games as a medium to tell stories, I think that's a really good reason to join the games industry. You know, you don't necessarily have to be like, oh, I grew up with hardcore games, et cetera, et cetera. So like speaking of gatekeeping, right, um, what factors do you think are preventing women from working in games? I mean, obviously now it's, it's better, but like I mentioned, we, we have a long way to go. Um. I would say the interest is definitely there. If you go um, into any university course, you will see a very healthy percentage of women going into uh, learning. Um, but specifically, usually the stories that I get told from uh, programmers specifically is because um, 
computer science programs in university uh, tend to be very male heavy, and the few um, you know female students who come in, to, they want to learn programming. You know, they're very first year they're extremely excited. By second year, they all drop out. Um, say for maybe one or two, mostly because um, there is rampant, uh, I don't want to say it, <laughs> <laughs> sexism, way. Yes, it's, uh, I really hate that word because it's, um, you know, it brings back a lot of very bad ideas and thoughts, but it's true, um, a lot of women don't feel like they are welcome. Again, the gatekeeping thing, purely because they are women. Um, I didn't realize you need a penis to program. Wow, do you, is that like a special keyboard down there? <laughs> but anyway, oh God, this is recorded, hey. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> so the women that persevere, they tend to be, you know, they want to be more inclusive, you know? There's a lot more programs out there to get more um, girls to program, you know? So um, within art, like, women are pretty much already welcomed within the art community, but, you know, with STEM specifically, um, and also programming, there's a huge divide still. So sometimes part of, the, part of the issue is also representation, in the sense that we need women who are already working in the industry to be more, um, you know, to kind of be exposed so that other girls can see like, oh, there's someone out there that looks like me who's working in the industry. So therefore it is a thing I can achieve. So tiny anecdote, um, just a few weeks ago, I had a lecturer send me an email asking, hi Anissa, um, someone sent me your email because you're the only Muslim female developer that they know. Um, so I've got a student from Saudi Arabia and she asked me, um, is there anyone else who looks like me that makes video games? Like, is, it, is it just me? And I, my heart broke so much. So I, I re responded with like a huge list of Muslim developers, um, both men and women, to say like, hey, we exist, we are here. And then, you know, I sent a good article of Fakhra here. It's like, look, she probably looks like you. <laughs> and yeah, and I've got a response saying like, oh, she's, she got super excited. She's the only um, girl, Saudi Arabian girl in her course, and she wants to continue being games developer. And there you go. I've, I've managed to get, hopefully get one more person through education and hopefully into the games industry in the future. That's amazing. Um, I know a few girls in Saudi who make video games, so I'll definitely, if whenever she reaches out, I'll connect her and like they can have their own sleepover yeah. party and talk about <laughs> games all night. Social media is great, like it because is. everybody knows each other, we exactly. could then tell the uh, the world that hey, we exist, yeah. we do things. Like yeah. if you want to get connected, we're all open. Our DMs are open. We always have our websites and our emails. Yep. Like we want more people to come in. You yeah, know? yeah, exactly. I like for for me when when like. Like I get to do a lot of events uh, back home in schools and universities. Uh, it can get a bit too much, but like I really want to push people and I really care about representation because for me growing up, I thought it was unicorns and that was ridiculous. Like it was real people that made them. Um, so like I want people to just kind of just consider it this as an option. You can do it as full time, you can do it as part time, you can do it as a hobby, you can tell your friends about it. Maybe they can find this as an outlet to express themselves. They can do it in their own room. Um, they can like have the option not never to release that game because it's so meaningful for them. They might want to release it later. So for me, representation and seeing people do this um, and uh, being diverse in your choices, like, yeah, we're gonna hire this person, but like, it's never, like, you have to make it authentic as well. It's like, never go through a marketing checklist. Like, yeah, we want girl, this and this and this and this and this. And for me, it felt like I was a token in certain events. I'm like, okay, cool. It gives me exposure, it puts like representation to a certain category, but um, like the other side is like, they do it as a marketing token. So uh, we have to like walk that fine line um, carefully. Um, and like women being represented in this industry is very important. And back home, uh, when we talk about like uh, IT students, we have a lot of girls who are in IT and a lot of boys go to, into business because they're like, it's too hard, I don't want to do it. Uh, because I read, <laughs> exactly, I read the studies um, about like girls not being into STEM. And I started to look closely into what we have in schools and universities. I've noticed it's a huge number. I would never ask the boys like, why, why do you like want to study business? Like it's easier, it's better. I can like do this and do that. 
And we're like, girls, what do you want to do this? Like programming a school. And they're like more focused. And I think maybe because girls are always put into categories like, oh, you have like certain duties or certain expectations in life. And they want to go beyond that. It's like, yeah, I have a skill and I want to prove it in this place or in that place. And that like depends after what happens in college. Will the workforce uh, be open to, to hire these talents? Um, I don't really know the stats there, but I know from schools and universities, girls tend to go into STEM, and that's pretty amazing to see. Another point that I also wanted to bring up was, so I was browsing through Twitter, <laughs> um, and I saw this Twitter thread by Katie Sharonis. She's a narrative designer at Riot Games, and she was talking about how she finally had a good PC setup to play games that she could play the latest games. And then she realized how a gaming setup um, impacts the preference or the kinds of games that you will play. And then she also started talking about how she noticed that a lot of women in games are secondhand gamers, which means that you only play games through your bro brother or your cousins or, or your friends, right? So, so the per percentage of women who are already secondhand gamers are really low. So the people, the women who end up being secondhand gamers, who end up being interested in making games are even lower. So, so which is why there's a disparity between like female game developers and male game developers. And I, I do think now with games being more accessible and more inclusive of women, and even like with mobile, like back then you would need to have a console or PC to be able to play a game. But now with mobile and with more accessibility, that more women will be more interested in games and then enter the games industry. Yeah. Yeah, like we were just talking about this. I mean, like it was so funny because um, I'm an FPS player. You know, I've been playing from Team Fortress Classic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and I always thought that I sucked at. Um, Same. Aiming, right? Same. So, oh yeah, we only choose the healers because I cannot aim, you know. Yeah. And I, I hear a lot of girls say that, and it's so heartbreaking. And it's, it's really not because they suck, but it's because they weren't given the mentors that yeah. guys have access to when they play in these games and communities. And when my spouse, he actually said, actually, just tweak your mouse sensitivity, and then I could finally aim, <laughs> like for once. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's really cool that um you you brought this up, you know. Yeah. Um, also about hardware, you know, when building computers, like, you know, when I go and buy my fan for my CPU and stuff like that, it's like, oh, are you buying for your boyfriend, you know? So I think the point is that, like, women face a consistent amount of mental labor required yes. to process all these little, little things, you know? That's why, like, while a like, huge chunk of our brain is, like, taken up with how do I deal with this, you know, like, I, I'm emotionally quite tired of this. Like, even before you want to go to buy PC parts, you have to be like, they're going to ask me these kind of questions, yeah. I have to answer it this way. Yeah, yeah it's pretty much, trick. you know, is this guy going to hit on me? Because yeah. he thinks like, oh, you know, yeah, this like female engineer, blah, blah. So, yeah, it's, it's a lot. So, I mean, like, the next question would be like, um, what can we do to encourage more women to um, see video games as a viable career? So there's two parts to this question, which I just thought of, which is listening to, to you about employment and stuff. Like, um, one is how do we attract entry level ones and how do we retain them? So I know Li Ying has something very special to share about, um, she has plans for students, right? in Malaysia and like I would love to hear, I think everybody should hear more about her plans, right? And see whether we can all help each other out with it. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, uh, I didn't think that's to be brought up, but. <laughs> it's, it's an awesome plan. Yeah. So. Uh, I was thinking of holding like women in games hangout meetups so that, that women can meet up um, monthly, I was thinking, uh, especially students. So. I come from KDU and I graduate from a games course. And when I do see my juniors uh, who are female and I go up to them and I'm like, hey, this is really cool. We can talk about this more. And they do put up a barrier because they think I'm a professional and they subconsciously put that barrier up. So I want to have that women in games hang out so that I create, I make sure to have that bridge so that they can talk to us. So even when they feel like they are students, they, they, don't, they don't bring anything to the table, but they do because when they graduate, they come into the games industry. And when they're scared, when they have safe spaces like these, like the Hangouts, then they can be more productive and they can thrive in a more productive space, yeah. 
Yeah, because like in Singapore, sometimes I go for these game meetups and, and yes, there, there are a quite a number of female students, but yeah. in Singapore, sometimes they don't appear for these meetups and the events are dominated by men, right? So it's really cool that what you're doing is providing a safe space and a good stepping stone for them mm -hmm. into the industry. So do any one of you want to chip in? Um, or entry level and uh, retainment. Yeah, um, like back home, we don't have really um, um, a college course or a program that offers game design, game development. It's always under the IT umbrella. Um, so I always get to see students, both like girls and boys, like talking like, oh, how did you get into this? Like, what did you do? What did you do? Like, even for myself, I have a business and IT degree. And then afterwards, after graduating from college, I went to a different school. That was like only short lived for like two years and they closed the program, sadly. Um, so we don't really have that. But like even for anyone who wants to get into this, um, having the passion for it, like I want to create, I want to do this. Um, for us, it has to come from within them because we don't really offer that. But then because the industry is very small, we don't really have a lot of jobs. They either like want to work with us at Hybrid Humans or like go to Ubisoft or like kind of group a, a team up with a couple of friends that they know. Um, so we're trying to grow the community. Four years ago, five years ago, it used to be like only like seven ish, and now we're like about forty plus, and that's like huge progress. Like those two guys joined me in the global game jam. Sorry to put you in the hot spot, mm -hmm. uh, but they joined me for the global game jam a few years ago, and like they don't really have any background in this, but like they have the interest. Uh, so doing these game jams and game events kind of like exposes what game development and game design to to people, and like it's really nice to see it growing every day and it's like more people uh for me it wouldn't be like i would love to just like do for for like women in games uh meetups but there aren't enough there may be like only like four <laughs> uh and most of them are students or actually all of them are students um but but it would be nice to kind of like just grow the community together and for us like i've never had um any bad issues with with the boys but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> so um, I'm based in London in the UK and uh, sorry this. <laughs> right. So I'm based in London in the UK and um, uh, it's, it's not a secret basically that the game industry exists. In the UK itself, there's a huge amount of um, studios uh, quite different from uh, the regions here or in Abu Dhabi. Um, so we have like thousands of studios, but most of them are actually like one or two um, man studios, like indie studios, you know, because the UK actually really encourages um, people to start their own business. So, um, this, I'm just, I just thought of something, sorry. So, Duolingo, which is this app that um, does um, language app, it's a language teaching app. Oh my God, I, I can't English today. <laughs> Right, so they had a tweet saying that their engineering team has reached 50% female uh, workforce, 50-50 male, female, and if you saw the comments, oh my god, it's so stupid, don't read the comments. But, yeah, so pe people are like, oh, why are you hiring them because of the women? And like, dude, they're hired because they're qualified and they can code. The difference here is that in the interview pool, they got more women to apply. They interviewed more women. And guess what? Everyone passed the same test, both male and female. That's what equality looks like. Way. <laughs> so basically, part of the problem is actually the recruitment process. It's not that there's no women to recruit. Like um, in the l recent few years, especially in the UK, the universities are pumping out game designers, game artists, programmers, what have you. They are there. Companies are just not looking for them. Even if there are, they're not doing it right. You know, sometimes just simple things like the way you word your recruitment um, page, you know, stuff like code ninja. The girls are like, I don't want to be a ninja, um, you know. Just use like gender neutral terms. You know, sometimes when you say like, applicant must be able to do X, Y, and Z, and he must X, Y, and Z. Suddenly there's a he in there. So women are just completely turned off. You're alienating half the population. So um, companies could definitely do way more to that doesn't make it sound inviting at all because like they've already specified the gender there exactly so sometimes um if you know if you're doing a recruitment drive have someone um 
preferably a woman, look through your words and just do a, like, you know, just do a check. Like, would, would women read this and think, yes, I can do this? The other issue that I just um, mentioned way earlier was that women tend to put themselves down. So a lot of women don't apply for jobs um, because they don't hit 100% of all the requirements. While guys, they see like, oh, 50%, yeah, I can do this. You know, and then they go into the interview and they just blag the way through. Like, you have no idea how many in applicants that we've got who are just like, oh, I see you did this. And they're like, uh, yeah, I did uh, for a little bit. And we're like, uh-huh, okay, cool. That's helpful. All right, next. So again, but then, you know, women are just prone to uh, think themselves as less when they really shouldn't. So if I were to give advice to anyone here who's, who wants to go into the industry, just apply literally just apply for everything and anything like you don't get to decide if you're hireable or not like that's their job your job is to show them to show the companies that you are available for work yeah and i'd like to add to that because and i think that's a very positive point to girls like they're not just like putting themselves down that's that means it's equality like they want perfection they want something that is good because like they see this requirement and it's like oh maybe i'm not good at that uh but like go go ahead and try that like go ahead and pause for that position and apply for it. And then you will see and you can improve meanwhile. Yeah. Guys are just like wanna wing it. Yeah. Uh, girls wanna do the right thing for the right reason. Right, so like if you, if you qualify for 60% of the requirements, go for it, it's fine, you know? Sometimes some of those things aren't necessarily like, uh, you know, set in stone that you need to know them. Usually they just want people who are like amazing at everything, but obviously you can be amazing at maybe seven out of 10 things. So even for myself, um, one of the jobs that I was hired for, um, I have no uh, idea how to use Unity because my last job, I use a whole different engine. I've never touched Unity in my life. I went to the interview and I was straight up honest with them. Look, I love UI, I can do UI. Like I'm really good at look at all the games I've already made. I just don't know the program, so. And you know what? This is not gonna be like, oh, she doesn't know the program, don't hire her. Like that was what most people think, that that is what would they think. But in reality, it kind of just gives the employer to gauge like, okay, so sh this person is good at art, good at UI, these certain soft skills, you know, they just don't know this specific technical skill, but she has good enough skill to carry her through, you know, and I got hired, thankfully, thank guys, and I learned Unity on the job. Like, it took me like maybe a few months just to get on my feet, but my, my uh, line manager, my colleagues, they're all really patient with me because they know I could bring something into the company, you know, because I have clout, because I've got a list of games that I've released, you know, I've got a good portfolio, and I just don't know technically how to use Unity. And I land on the job. And I've mentioned this story a few times before, and there has been men who would reply to my tweets about this, saying like, oh, it must be nice to be able to, to get hired for a job for a thing you don't know about. Like, it'd be great if I could learn something on the job too. And I'm like, dude, F off, because like, I have experience, you know, I've done my work, I've done what I can in an interview, I got, into, I got the job because they know I can do it. On merit, exactly. Yeah, I think it's a really good point, and I say this in a lot of the women in games and panels, is that I think all traits need to be valued equally, not just the hard skills, not just the technical skills, but for you, like the aptitude for learning, like, you know, surprisingly, not a lot of people have that, right? So, <laughs> I mean, but it is important that all these soft skills and, and things are, are very important, especially when you're a hirer and you need to have a keen eye to look out for these things and, and genuinely believe the, the gifts that they bring to your company, right? So actually, Anissa, just now, like a while back, you mentioned a, a bit about um, a bit about role models, right? Female role models. So on the topic of retainment, right? Do, do you have any um, tips on how companies can continue retaining their staff? Because we had this conversation earlier about mm -hmm. how um, a lot of uh, women, especially, are still expected to give, for example, caregiving duties. You know, that's yeah. why they, they women enter the industry, but they are often don't go far enough to leadership position. Promote your women. <laughs> Leadership roles, exactly. Um, again, I'm basing this off my experience in the UK and thankfully there are a few, not many, but there are enough women in leadership roles in the UK. Um, we have 
we have Siobhan Reddy, who, um, who is the head of Media Molecule, uh, the company behind A Little Big Planet, and they've got the new game Dreams coming up soon. And then we have Joe Twist, who is um, the CEO of Yuki. Um, I know these are just names that you might not know, but in the UK, like people know these names. Um, and uh, we have, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm gonna stop listening for a moment, but basically, we do have people in those roles and they can't, they're a bit of a, you know, something, a bar that we could achieve. And I know, even for myself, in my personal experience, uh, in all of the jobs that I've been in, I don't have a lot of female bosses, but I do have um, peers who, who are women and they're doing great in the sense that I can see their trajectory going like, you're gonna be like a head honcho at some point, you know, they're fucking, oop, they're really amazing <laughs> people. I can't swear my mom's gonna see this and she's gonna get angry. Um, uh, I've lost my train of thought, what was I gonna say? Uh, yeah, so within retainment is, <laughs> with retainment, it's literally just promote your women and you know treat them the same because you do hear certain horror stories from other companies where women who have certain ideas and they speak up in uh, in meeting rooms and they kind of just brush it off and then uh, um, you know a male colleague later on says the same idea and something like, wow that's amazing why didn't you say that earlier and then she's like really really um, yeah so. Um, so it's one of those things where it's not enough just to hire women, but it's also you need to listen to them. Like you hire them for a reason, you know, and you need to believe that they can do certain things. And um, I'm I'm gonna start rambling. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, oh, oh. Yeah. Um, I think all three of your points were like women have to constantly <laughs> prove themselves. And I didn't know how badly that was an effect and until my friend sent me this video for a talk and it was this woman, she was a programmer and her name is Alice Chin and she was giving a talk at DockerCon and her title was Shaving My Head Made Me a Better Programmer. So basically when she was studying to be a programmer, she was the top of her class, but people still didn't take her seriously. And when she came out to work, it was the same thing. People didn't take her seriously. And the constant advice that she would get would be like, be a badass programmer. And what does that mean? So she was like trying to figure out what does a badass programmer mean? And she, she took that and she started give, yeah, taking initiatives. She started giving talks at conferences so that her peers would take her seriously. And even then, her peers wouldn't take her seriously. And finally, she did this thing where she shaved her head off and people started to take her seriously. She was a better programmer. And she realized that it was because she was no longer a hyper-feminine figure in the hyper-masculine space. And then that people started taking her seriously. And her conclusion was that it's not on women to try to constantly prove ourselves. It's on the community to be like, hey, we hear you, we listen to you, we have to change. And we need to have male allies to say that all the time because it's hard on us. It's, it's always on the women to be like, hey, are you a good artist? Why, why do we need to constantly prove ourselves? And um, just male allies, that's a huge thing because yeah. guys listen to other guys more than they listen to girls. You know, sometimes we need a guy to be like, hey, she, was, she said something there, you know, like pipe down, you know, and then something <laughs> they all shut up. What? What? Yeah, and there was recently this Victoria's Secret model that was a programmer, yeah. and the comments were like fuming, like they were asking her to prove her programming skills. Like that didn't make sense to me. Like why? Just because she was a model, she's feminine? Because then she can't be a programmer? That didn't make sense. You can be a Barbie girl and you can go like the F Yeah, exactly. exactly. Like, that makes no sense. Yeah, like... Oh, that's so frustrating, makes me annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> like caps lock, F off. <laughs> oh my God, I forgot the question. What can be done to encourage more women? Well, like just putting those tweets on mute, I guess, would be the good first thing. <laughs> um, so it's like for mature industries or for small industries, um, like I'm, I'm the CEO of my own company, so I, I am the leader of the company. I do make the decisions and the hiring 
decisions in, in the studio. Um, I love to support girls, I love to support guys, like everything should just be on merit. Your gender is so irrelevant to anything in life. Whatever you do, it's like, can you do it? Yes? Cool. That, that's, that should be it. It's very, very simple. I really don't understand why people make it complicated. Um, I've been like living in my own bubble, so I've really been away from social media and like getting to see or hear about that. Duolingo, I saw the post, I was like, oh, awesome. In the future, I want to be like that. I will have like, like a 50-50 equality. I will try to go for that. But like, we are a very small company right now. All the applicants, all the portfolios I've seen online, were just good because they were good. Like, I never thought, I was like, oh, guy, yes, let's have them. Girls, no, X. I don't, I want to be the only girl in the company. Uh, I mean, that makes no sense. Um, so I. I want to have more girls in the company, uh, but yeah, honestly, it should just be on merit. Like, don't look at the gender. It's and very that's, relevant. That's also because not all merits are created equal or valued equally, yeah. right? I mean, you were talking about how this woman had to shave her head to be taken seriously. Yes. I mean, femininity is also a trait. I mean, just now it we is. talked about like how traits should be valued equally, soft skills, whatever skills, mm -hmm. you know? So that's a huge thing. So, I want to do an mm -hmm. experiment and just go to work in the like f most feminine outfit ever and see what happens. And I think maybe like around the world, we should all do it, where girls just yeah. dress up in like the pinkiest stuff. Or maybe it could be Wednesday because mean girls, right? I was gonna, um, I was gonna say, and, that's just called Wednesday where I'm at. <laughs> right? <laughs> we, yeah. should, we should do that and see what happens in the workforce. The girls in my company, we all dress up to the nines just because the bar is Wednesday? so low. Yeah, we're just like, suddenly we're that's like, good. there's we, we're hiring more girls in my company and we're all wearing heels so you can hear pop, 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 pop. Nice. It's great. <laughs> Me and my teammate, we do match on Wednesday sometimes unintentionally with wearing pink. He's a fan of Mean Girls. I'm a fan of Mean Girls. Like, hey, it's Wednesday. <laughs> In my last company, I used to wear heels a lot, and then if I walked through the through the hall, um, you could hear because it, the it's just wooden floors, so you could hear do 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 do. And then it wasn't after I left the company that some drunk colleagues, ex colleagues, um, said that oh, you had a nickname. We called you Stompy because you like stomp through. I was like, are you f serious? And um, he's drunk. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, it was like, like um. Okay, okay, not like yeah. The it was, it was at a bar. And we were all like hanging out and stuff. Um, but yeah, and I, I felt like, oh my gosh, like how dare they? But now in my new company, still wooden floors. But then there's more. It's not just me. There's like at least two other women with heels, and we're all stomping everywhere. I'm like, take that. <laughs> stomping march has to be a thing. <laughs> so like, I mean, okay, this question, if if if. Yeah, just share what you feel comfortable to share. I mean, are there any challenges that y'all faced due to your own gender in the industry? Yeah. We've already touched on that. People not taking us seriously. Yeah, what else can we say? <laughs> They, they like, at least I've seen that people um, assume that we make games for girls only, educational Barbie games. I'm like, dude, come on. Like, that's fine. I don't really... Nothing don't wrong play with those that. games like exactly i don't play them myself like there's nothing wrong with that you can make it super pinky and it kind of like made it as a choice like most of our games have pink on them and i don't really care if boys don't like them i was like if it fits the game if it's the game if it's too pinkish for you it's like tough like bye bye yeah. on that Download note, the other like 90s barbies game are the best they're actually really well designed 90s and two I, some people are nodding their heads see Barbie game. Don't put down Barbie games. They're actually really well designed. In fact, Barbie Dreamhouse, the animated series on Netflix, are also it's really well written. And you know what? Barbie has like a vlog right now where talking to women, to girls about you know girl power and being confident in yourself. Yeah, I don't know why we're using Barbie as like a thing to look down on just because it's pink and it's girly and it appeases to young girls. That is dumb as. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So really, like these are really good things that are happening and like. Just the other day, we were saying, oh yeah, we're game developers. And then suddenly a guy just like, oh, do you... Yes. <laughs> what was oh it? Do you God. make games without blood and gore? It's like, yeah, but we also make games with blood and gore. We make all kind of games, you know? Yeah. Okay, we're done. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, so like, yeah, exactly. It's all these, like, just now we talk a lot about mental labor, right? It's all these, like, constant barrage of, like, comments, whether it's small comments about sexism or assumptions about what kind of games you make. It's, it's such a huge thing to deal with. So that's why male allies, you guys, please. <laughs> awesome. Um, what do you think? I mean, just now you already mentioned that uh, women can bring more empathy into games, right? Are there any other things that women can bring into the industry? Anything else that you can think of? Diversity, empathy? Like, the industry grew with men. Um, so whatever we've seen in the past 20 years in the gaming industry was done by like a very specific group of people. So if you can look at the games from the last 10 years, and I think that's when more women started to get into the industry, you can see the difference from those games to this. And I think like that's what women can bring into the conversation. Um, it can be Doom, Doom is freaking awesome. Uh, but also like you get to see more and more layers to it. Um, and I think like we can see the proof in the last 10 years how games have changed over time. Yeah. Um there's a recent Kickstarter that was funded successfully by uh, Kid Fox Games, where uh, it's a game called Boyfriend Dungeon. It's a dungeon crawler where you can date weapons. I love yeah, that. so you have like swords that turn into people, like, and uh, there's a sword that turns into a man, a sword that turns into a woman, and, the, and a non-binary character. One, you can date a cat that turns into a weapon, like. You know what? If it's a room, a boardroom full of old white guys, they're not going to think that was going to sell. Right. But that particular company, Kid Fox Games, they're headed by a woman, and they're like mostly female as well. And they they had so much support from the community to make that video game. And you know, if you ask me this like five years ago, ten years ago, but like, <laughs> are you serious? What is some Tumblr shit? And like, but it's not. It's actually things that people want to play right. because why? Because women. <laughs> We run the industry. <laughs> <laughs> we will be, huh? Um, so I think we are coming to a close. Um, last question. What advice would you give to a woman who are considering games development as a career? If you have a yeah, paragraph, one-liner. I think to reach out to other women and create safe spaces. Uh, here in Malaysia and Singapore, we have a women in games group. And if your region doesn't have one, band together with other women to create your own and male allies. Like, sadly, your voices as males bring more weight than ours at the moment, and we do need your help. Yeah. I think just do it. Don't be afraid. If you want to do it, just go ahead, experiment with it. If you like it, stick with it. If not, just go explore a different option. Um, we need to be in this industry because we're the ones that are going to make it good, sustainable for women. And we're just going to make it better and improve it because diversity matters in this industry. Yeah, just go for it. Um, I wouldn't say the game industry is for everyone, but I would like it to be open to everyone. You know, I want people to be able to come in and see for themselves what they can do, what they can contribute to the games industry, regardless if they're male, female, or anything else. You know, um, and once you're in, I want you to find your niche, carve out like a, an identity for yourself, something that is unique to you, and that is not, a, you know, it's not a problem. Uh, I don't know what I'm talking about here, but <laughs> yes, basically just go for it. Um, if there are gatekeepers that you come across, ignore them, one. And number two, go find people who are willing to take you in. There are so many people out there, especially on Twitter, on Tumblr, on Facebook, yeah. what have you. Social media is great. The internet is amazing. You get to talk to people like so-and-so, so and, -so, so -and -so, yeah. you know? <laughs> just send them a message. Like The worst that they could do is not reply. Whatever, go to the next person, ask for advice, yeah. go to forums, go to Twitter, go to anything. People are so open, okay? Like, um, yeah, and I think there's so much to, to do in this industry. Maybe you don't want to be technical, maybe you don't want to be an artist, maybe you can host events, maybe you can just like open up the door for people to, to express themselves, to come and play video games. Uh, there's like an event that I've seen in the US uh, that celebrates um, disabled people to be more inclusive for them. Mm -hmm. They've hosted that event and I want to have something similar in the UAE. I want to do that because I think video games are so open. There's, I think they're for everyone. So it's just like up for us to like kind of open up the door and make it happen. So just like find something that you love and you're good at and be confident about it and just do it. If it makes uh, yeah. people 
happy. Do the thing. Do, do the, the thing. thing. <laughs> do the go thing. Do the yes, thing. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, say I'm going to do the thing and then go do the thing. Exactly. And then you tell me you did the thing and I'm like, oh, you did the thing. <laughs> All things making are fun. <laughs> Freaking awesome quotes from everyone. Um, last quote from me is more, more advice, lah, but like, be visible. I mean, it is great. I mean, again, I want to thank like MDAC for, for having us, uh, Level Up Care for having us here. Like, like I said, it's been, we spent a couple of years talking about this and it has happened. We have wonderful panel of women over here being visible, wonderful people in the audience being visible. It matters yes. a lot, right? So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you to the awesome panelists. Thank you. And if I can add one oh, more yeah, thing. Are there any questions? Yeah. If I can add one more thing. Um, out of like all the events I've attended, like only a handful, like this event has the biggest number of girls I've ever seen. So thank you so much for coming and thank you so much for like getting into this industry or even if you're just curious about it, keep keep doing it. It's super, super awesome to see to see everyone here. And for me, I live my life by saying like infinity and beyond. Uh, I grew up with Disney, I love Disney, so to infinity and beyond for whatever decision that you want to make in life. Do the thing. Right, questions? <laughs> so thank you for the awesome talk. Uh, we've been talking about how industry treats women, but I want to ask something about how do we deal with the families? Because I used to run a game media back in Indonesia, and after years of running, I finally found a female writer. I hired her because she's really good, but on her third month, she said she needs to leave because her mom told her to leave because she needs to do other things. She needs to do her role. And I don't know how to talk her through. And I definitely don't know. I definitely don't have access to her family. And yeah, you get the question, right? I, I think that's, that's kind of common for women to have like traditional roles, expectations, and so many different cultures. Um, I think that's a, like an open conversation, a huge conversation to have with the community because that's a very traditional look into like, oh, girls, they need to get married and blah, blah, blah. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's part of life. Uh, but it should never be a restriction. They can ro work remotely if that's also a possibility. So we just have to be flexible about uh, what works and what doesn't. Every person has certain expectations of life and certain goals and their parents would have something also, maybe different or similar. Uh, go to the internet and find statistics of numbers of how big the game industry is in billions of dollars and say like, hi, that's me. I work in this industry, you know, because again, I keep saying this, um, video games are a mainstream um, platform of, of entertainment. So therefore, there are jobs that can pay. I'm not saying they pay great most of the time, but you know, what does? Um, but yes, a lot is, it's not your place, obviously, to convince someone else's parents that they should be able to do what they want to do. But you could always influence that person, especially if they're a woman, they, you know, they're a bit more, you know, they, they don't want to offend their parents. Believe me, I had to do a lot of uh, convincing my parents as well, you know. The only reason that I went into animation was because they wouldn't let me to go into comics, because like, you, you're gonna die, you don't make money in comics, and to be honest, she was right, like, I would have died. Because <laughs> I cannot draw that many comic pages in like a day. Um, but basically it's a lot of like sitting down and kind of saying like, okay, look, I know you think this industry doesn't give, it, give in money, but this is my skills and this is what I'm passionate about. And I found someone who believes in me, who's paying me, paying me money to do this thing that I love in the industry that I love. And look at how much money this industry is making. At some point, that money's gonna be mine, you know? <laughs> and also, 
<laughs> and there's also like uh, remote working, flexi time and things like that. So yes, women can have families and still be in the games industry. Um, in the UK right now, especially with my company, uh, men are will have the same amount of parental leave as women because we believe in parental care. We want you to have a good work-life balance. It's not just the women that needs to, you know, um, do the baby stuff because sometimes you know what parents adopt and you need both parents for that sometimes you have single parents and single parents aren't just single moms no they're single dads as well you know so the world is changing right now and sometimes um especially with the older generation you kind of have to convince them like that's how things were but this is how things are now and this fits me as a person i can do this believe in me then don't worry i'm not gonna die i have a job anyone else uh, I guess this is sort of relevant to at least uh, two of you, but um, I'd say that in, an, in affecting change socially in this kind of field, there's two places. There's being a parent and the way you sort of bring up your daughter about what, what kind of expectations you sort of encourage them to have. But then there's also sort of people who shape the industry. And this is why it's relevant to, I guess, uh, Fakra and Gwen, since you're both studio founders, right? Um, when it comes down to sort of demographic pursuits, like say you create you create projects uh, that are targeted at audiences, how do you deal with um, maybe sort of unwittingly forwarding negative assumptions about female audi audiences? They may be small things, like just a small assumptions about taste, but they sort of propagate forward to being like really, really poisonous down the line. How do you sort of, how do you think about that? How do you avoid it? Um, for us, it's extremely relevant because, I mean, Inbound Interactive is a service provider. So we work on a lot of projects, 100 over projects, and definitely we've come across projects that have um, uh, put women in a distasteful light and stuff like that. But it is difficult also because we have to sustain ourselves. But it's important that if you, if you run a startup, right, your mission and your core values has to be very, very um, solid from the start. You have to get together with co-founders. My co-founder Sharon is right there. And we've definitely argued about certain things. You know, for example, gambling, the aspect of gambling in games is something that, you know, to her it destroys families, but to me it brings in income. And we've always had this conversation, you know, about like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, and it's very important to have those mission and values. And the mission and values for our company came from that discussion. It's important to like talk about it within your co-founders. And, and sometimes it may even be a case-by-case -case basis and stuff like that. Obviously, we have our limitations. For example, um, if you are a service provider and you come across a game that, for example, promotes um, child pornography, like... You know, will, will you work on that for money? You know, or it, it presents women in a demeaning manner. If demeaning on a scale of one to ten, like like how demeaning, right? You know, if it's just like boobs, you know, flopping around like many games out there, <laughs> you know, is that considered demeaning as opposed to like really like like I don't know, I don't want to talk about the games that are super demeaning, but yeah, you, you get what I mean. So it, we don't have a rule per se, but it's important to always have that conversation with your co-founders, you know, or even with your staff, you know, because your staff are part of your company as well. Um, for me, we try to make a very conscious decision because we do take in some client projects um, and we're very picky with the projects that we do, not just because it might be, because like we want to do something that we're proud of and that we will enjoy the development process of that. So whenever we get any client projects, the team and I, we just like sit down, discuss it. Would this be fun to do? Uh, how much money are we gonna make out of this? And how long will it take us to develop? Are we gonna learn something new in this project that would help us in future projects? And if it was like, very offensive for whatever reason. We try to say no to those clients. And for our own video games, the creative process is like a very conscious effort of us trying to make uh, something that we're gonna be proud of and we never wanna offend anyone. We just want to be as inclusive as possible in our video games. Simplest things like you add a colorblind option for people to enjoy your game. Yeah, so small things really matter. Um, and if you have that conscious and open conversation with your team, I think it helps. 
Sorry, I just remembered a small anecdote about choosing projects. Um, so I had a friend who was a freelancer, a freelance developer, programming and all that. And because he was freelance, he doesn't get that many jobs. Um, so he was offered a job to do a booby game. <laughs> um, yeah, it was like a Japanese game that was all boobs and all panty shots and things like that. But um, it was a localization project and it, was, it paid so much money because no one would take it. <laughs> and he had this dilemma, I was like, should I, should I do this? And he asked me, I was like, but money, but movie games, but you know, and he's like, he's a male ally, you know, and he's like, but I believe in you guys, I don't want to, and then I was like, dude, dude, do you have money right now in your bank? And he was like, not that much. And I was like, just do it, just because you know what, you need to survive. And I, was, I told him like, just take the job. If you really need the money, just tell them, don't put your name in the credits and don't put it in your CV. There you go. Your tracks are covered, but you get the money. It's a bread and butter thing. Um, thankfully, he, he got another job, so he didn't have to take that job in the end. But for a while, he was like, ooh, booby money. Uh. Yeah, totally agree on the taking of your, your brand name from the project. You know, you don't want to be associated with this thing. But, you know, coincidentally, you know, we may be lucky or what, but, but a lot of companies that have questionable uh, uh, themes in their games happen to be shitty clients to work with. So we've been quite lucky in that, in, in rejecting them or even like breaking the contract because, you know, we, we haven't felt like we were respected for our time and our work as well. So, you know, you can count us lucky. Though. Do you have time for any more questions? One. one more question? All right, one more. We have a nice little lady there. Little, I'm sorry, you're not little. <laughs> Quite I tall. I can't go back here. Again. <laughs> Please stand tall. You're a woman. You're a strong woman. There we go. Okay. Uh, thank you for the talk. You all inspire me. You are so sassy. I love you. <laughs> Ouch. Uh, so I started in this industry like one year ago and it's all European males and one of them even came to me like don't you think you're underqualified for your job and like you came here just because of nepotism like yeah okay you, and then you, he want, me, you want me to slap him for you I'll do that for you <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, he, he quit the company so I was like yeah I won bye okay, good <laughs> but my question is uh, so it's a very male culture uh, industry so do you in your daily life do you adapt to this culture or do you try to bring your own like you know feminine uh, point of view to the companies usually so for me I try to adapt but at the same time I don't want yeah booby games yeah no I don't like that <laughs> um, right so when you say sorry when you say culture do you mean like the developer culture or the um, consumer culture. Sorry, I'm gonna say the word, like the sexist culture. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, right, so when I first started the industry, I tried very hard to be one of the boys. And it's the same thing with the girl, the girl programmer who shaved her head, suddenly she got um, taken seriously. You can sit down now. Um, Thank you. She wasn't taken seriously until she shaved her head. Again, th that is a very, that is part of the community issue where they don't take you seriously unless you look like the boys or you act like one of the guys, you know, or, you know, someone makes a sexist joke and you kind of have to laugh along with it. <laughs> you know, there's just, I had I did that so many times when I was younger in my early 20s. Um, I had students who come up to me to ask for advice and they put in a sexist joke right in the middle of it. Um, a student was asking about something and I said, oh, developing a game would be very long and hard. And he goes straight in, oh, that's what she said. And I was like, boot, fuck off, get out. Anyway, well, that's what I wish I said, but I actually, I went, ha, 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 uh -huh. Anyway, yeah, I just brushed it off. Again, I was very meek. But I learned, you know, again, this comes with experience, comes with age, where you start to care less about what people think about you. And now I wear dresses, I wear earrings, I wear jewelry, I wear heels that stomp all over the place. I was like, yes, I'm a very feminine woman, but some days I'll be wearing a t-shirt and jeans. Just you do you, you know? Like, it's not on you to, to, to change the, the perception of what a game developer should be. You know, so and there's also I got really lucky in a sense that with each um, new company that I joined, um, the the men are more and more progressive. Like uh, I do work with older guys in their 40s and 50s, but they are so open to my ideas. I'm much younger than them. I'm Asian. I'm a woman, but they still value me as part of the team. Sometimes it's all about um, you know, positioning yourself in the team that values you for who you are. So you don't have to spend so much emotional labor thinking like, oh, I need to be 
I need to, you know, be more quiet, or I need, I can't do my hair today, or you know, oh, I'm, me, me, whatever, you know, don't do that. Be yourself, you know. Like people will accept you for who you are because you bring in the skill, you bring in the talent, you bring in the perspective that no other guy could could do. Completely agree. Yeah. That's just fucking like I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> just like just be yourself. Wear whatever you want. If they don't accept it, they don't accept it. Like it will never affect your work. So as long as you're doing a great job, you're doing a great job. Who cares what you wear, what you dress at? I think the thing with that is constantly championing yourself as a woman is it gets really exhausting. It gets emotionally exhausting. So again, I think male allies. We we constantly need male allies to be there. Yeah. Just to add really quickly, this is not a male bashing session. Like we do love all the guys in our lives, um, our colleagues, our parents, our um, boyfriends, husbands, friends. All of them are great. Um, it's be we're here because of them. You know, they understand our plight. And you know what? We thank you, all the guys who do help out with us, who do call themselves feminists because they know feminism equals equality. It's not necessarily like you know we're not taking. Yeah, we're not taking power away from men. We're just giving power more to women so that they are on the equal levels, you know? So male allies are important to us because we want to be seen as your peers. And um, we don't hate men. I'm, I'm dating a man, wow, <laughs> surprise. I do like them. <laughs> so there you go, like we just want equality. We want everyone to just fucking get along. Uh, fuck. Right. I'm not gonna say the word again. <laughs> okay. Um, any more questions or? Okay. Cool. Thank you so much for uh, coming. <laughs>